When someone triggers a slab avalanche, what is going on inside the snowpack? To get a current understanding of the process inside the snowpack, I teamed up with avalanche scientist Carl Berkland and Ron Siemenhuis. In this clip, the crown fracture appears upslope of the rider. To see the connection between the rider and the crown fracture, let's look inside the snowpack with an animation. The moving rider stresses the upper snowpack as shown by the red bulb. The stress under the skier causes a brittle crack shown in black. If the crack is longer than what is called a critical crack length, the crack propagates beyond the stressed area under the rider. It propagates in the weak layer away from the trigger point, including up the slope. The crown and other boundaries of the slab fracture releasing the slab, which slides down the slope. Here are the stages that we'll use in this video. Stress under the moving rider cracks the weak layer. If the crack is longer than the critical crack length, the crack propagates in the weak layer. The crown and other boundaries of the slab fracture releasing the slab. The first stages of natural avalanche release are different, but once the crack or initial failure reaches the critical length, the latter stages are the same. In a few minutes, we'll look more at the early stages of dry natural slab avalanche release. Research suggests the critical crack length can range from less than a slab thickness to perhaps 10 times the slab thickness. Also in a few minutes, we will explain that there are two stages to dynamic crack propagation in the weak layer. Okay, here's a clip of a skier stomping to trigger a dry slab avalanche. Let's back up. Just before the skier stomped, what was going on under their skis? Maybe there was no crack in the weak layer, or maybe there was a crack that was not long enough to propagate. Here we see a skier initiating a brittle crack. But the skier crack was not long enough to propagate away from the stressed area under the skier. Now, with additional dynamic stress from a slightly bigger jump, the skier cracks a deeper weak layer. But again, this skier crack also does not reach the critical length. Riders commonly initiate subcritical cracks like these in shallow weak layers. With more dynamic stress from an even bigger jump, the crack is long enough to propagate. It propagated to and shook the tripod holding the camera. But how long does a crack have to be for sustained propagation away from the trigger point? Well, it varies depending on whether or not there is dynamic stress under a rider and on conditions such as recent rapid loading. Here are some experiments by Carl Berkland using the propagation saw test. Carl explains how recent loading can shorten the critical length of the saw cut, making avalanches more likely. I did some experiments where I added varying amounts of disaggregated snow to an existing snowpack, and I allowed this added snow to center for about an hour. The pre-existing snowpack had about 10 centimeters of low density snow on top of the surface hoar layer. As you can see, adding snow shortened the critical crack length. Here we are adding 15 centimeters of snow and the PST cut length was only four centimeters. And with 20 centimeters of snow added, you'll see that we just barely touch the weak layer with the saw and we get a two centimeter critical crack length before we get propagation. So adding the snow created increasingly reactive conditions so this look inside the snowpack shows us that an unstable snowpack has a shorter critical crack length, at least for weak layers that are not too deep. Recent rapid loading by snowfall or wind loading will shorten the critical crack length, making avalanches more likely. Rapid warming, including sun on fresh dry snow, can change light fluffy powder into a slab that is capable of propagating cracks. Research suggests this is a much weaker effect on slab avalanching than rapid loading. However, perhaps because the rapid warming effect is less obvious than rapid loading, the resulting dry slab avalanches are sometimes difficult to forecast. Also, rapid warming can soften hard slabs to the point where crack initiation and propagation are possible. So, rapid loading can shorten the critical crack length and consequently make natural and rider-triggered dry slab avalanches more likely. But for natural slab avalanches, 
How does the crack or initial failure in the weak layer form? Let's start with creep on an avalanche slope. This clip shows two hours of fluffy snow creeping in a few seconds. Watch the dot that starts inside the circle. Creep consists of settlement, shown by the green arrow, and shear, shown by the red arrow. Let's focus on shear because it is more closely related to breaking bonds in a weak layer. Any condition that will speed up creep will increase the shear rate in the upper weak layers. When weak layers shear faster, stability decreases and the critical crack length becomes shorter. As Carl mentioned, these conditions include rapid loading by snowfall or wind. Weak layers creep faster than the slab or layer below the weak layer. When snow deforms, bonds break, shown by red dots, and new bonds form, shown by green dots. In the weak layer, the deformation, as well as the breaking and forming of bonds, is concentrated at the upper and lower boundaries of the weak layer, adjacent to the stiffer layers. For a natural slab avalanche, there must be more bonds breaking than forming, and in places, the breaking bonds will be close to one another. If the shear component of creep is fast enough, the damaged area will grow into a ductile failure zone, traditionally called a deficit zone. If the deformation rate is not sustained, the ductal failure will heal, that is, new bonds will form faster than bonds are breaking. The life of a ductal failure zone is not well understood, but perhaps a few hours for a persistent weak layer, and much less, perhaps a few minutes, for a non-persistent weak layer. However, if the failure zone reaches a critical length, called the critical crack length, the crack will accelerate and propagate, which is the same as for rider triggering. Regardless of whether the crack was caused by a ductal failure or the brittle crack under rider, if the crack is long enough, it will propagate freely away from the trigger point. The latter stages of crack propagation and slab release are the same. Recent research by Joan Gohm and colleagues has shown that there are two stages to dynamic crack propagation. The first stage involves substantial collapse in the weak layer, which is driven by a bending wave in the slab. In the second stage, called super shear, Tension in the slab drives shear crack propagation in the weak layer. This animation only shows propagation upward from the trigger point. In the first stage, the bending wave and collapsing crack usually propagate at 15 to 45 meters per second. This is what we see in the first 10 or so meters away from the trigger point, and also in snowpack instability tests. After that, the crack changes into high gear, which is called super shear. During super shear, the crack speed can exceed 100 meters per second. At some point, upslope of where the crack initiates, the slab fractures in tension, which is called the crown. But don't believe this animation. Let's look at the process in the real world. Here we see a rider landing, then falling down a slope. Somewhere around here, the rider started the crack in the weak layer. Now, as a result of the crack propagating upslope, we see the crown fracture. In the field, we see the crown fracture on the surface, but not the crack propagation in the weak layer that causes the crown fracture. Well, that's not quite true. Ron Siemenhuis has developed a technique so we can see very subtle disturbances on the snow surface that are caused by crack propagation in the weak layer. Carl is going to show one of Ron's results. In addition, Ron Siemenhuis has recently investigated a slope scale crack propagation Using advanced video magnification techniques, these techniques allow him to detect snow surface disturbances that can only be associated with weak layer cracking in videos of human triggered avalanches. As you can see, the weak layer cracks long before the crown. This is further evidence that the tensile crown is caused by a propagating crack in the weak layer. So you're probably asking, does the modern understanding of rider triggered cracks, critical crack length, and dynamic crack propagation help us? Well, here are four ways these concepts about cracks are relevant to travel in avalanche terrain. Triggering on the flats, shooting cracks, triggering from areas where the slab is thin, which is insidious, and snowpack instability tests. On the flats or gentle slopes, a rider sometimes causes the weak layer to collapse. If the collapse is long enough, that is, longer than the critical crack length, it will propagate away from the rider. 
a bending wave in the slab drives the propagating collapse in the weak layer. The propagating collapse in a weak layer is often accompanied by a wolf sound as air is forced out of the weak layer. So a wolf is like the snowpack farting in your general direction. In terms of crack propagation, a wolf is the same as a rider triggered avalanche, except wolves occur on slopes not steep enough for the slab to slide. If the collapsing crack propagates up a slope that is steep enough to slide, a slab avalanche breaks from the slope and may slide down towards the rider that triggered the crack in the weak layer, sometimes hitting the rider. The propagating collapse often stops at a brittle crack through the slab called a shooting crack. So a shooting crack is often the boundary of a wump. These are easier to see when the collapse is large or the snow surface is hard, for example, wind stiffened. The photo shows the traverse where a fatal slab avalanche was triggered from a thin spot. Here is how the crack starts at a thin spot and propagates inside the snowpack. To see a video on triggering from a thin spot, search for these keywords. Modern instability tests like the extended column test and propagation saw test leave the slab mostly intact, which is important for crack propagation driven by a bending slab. The results of these tests represent both crack initiation and crack propagation. Testing for propagation is important because riders often initiate cracks in shallow weak layers. However, crack propagation is missing from older small column tests like the compression test. There are many how-to videos on these tests. You can search for these keywords. However, keep in mind that snowpack instability tests are small in relation to the size of an avalanche start zone, so they cannot fully capture all the processes involved in slab avalanche release. For backcountry recreation, these tests can be used to help assess if the slope is unstable, but we do not recommend that recreationists use them to tell if a slope is stable. There's simply too much spatial variability, and you may have dug in an area with a relatively stable snowpack. We hope this inside the snowpack look at rider triggered dry slab avalanches is helpful. Please leave your comments and questions below, or you can contact us by email.